Okay, so the discussion section is where we put the findings into contexts, it's where we discuss our contributions, and it's where we talk about the prospects for future research. Never ever bring results into the discussion. If it's results, it belongs in the results section. Right? So you've, if you've got results in the discussion section, you've missed part of your paper. You need to cut that and put it back in the results. Or cut it and leave it out completely. Because if it's not addressing your research question and it's not part of that theme that we talked about earlier about having that central bit and what you need to know to understand that and what that means, then that's actually part of a different paper and you're just excited because you've collected data on it. But that doesn't mean that the reader or reviewer is interested in that as well. In my opinion, it's really okay to discuss multiple plausible explanations for something that you found. In fact, I think of that as a real strength in a paper. You could say, look, we found this result and, you know, this was a mechanistic study, so we weren't able to determine the actual reason for this, but there's three main ideas in the literature, and this includes this, this, and this, and we weren't able to parse them out, but, you know, someone in the future should start doing the, me the mechanistic modeling or whatever of this, right? I think it's a really sort of uh, scholarly way of approaching it, which says, I found this relationship, I can't explain it using the methods that I have, but here's why I think this may be happening. So some good questions to ask yourself in the discussion is a, have you answered your research question? You know, um, does my study change the way that people, scientists, managers, policymakers, should be doing their business, right? Uh, is this new or is it just confirming the obvious that's been stated many times before? Be a bit honest with yourself about that. Uh, what are the applications of what you've done to both management and to theory? And what are the limitations? Right. So my recipe for <coughs> an intro, or sorry, for discussion is that I generally describe my results from a broad perspective, right? So here's a paper I did a while back. Uh, you know, in debates about environmental change, uh, adaptive capacity is generally viewed as positive characteristics for individuals and societies. However, when viewing problems through a broader social ecological systems lens, responses that appear desirable in the short term may actually increase the vulnerability of social ecological system, blah, blah, blah. So that's sort of stepping back and taking that sort of high altitude view of what you're doing again, a sentence or two that sort of, you know, really gets it at that, that high level. The second part, you want to review your results in the context of other studies. What have other people found? Was your study consistent with or contrasting with other studies? You need to explain why. And again, I always suggest doing this thematically rather than sort of chronologically or by each paper. Like so-and-so did this, but then so-and-so found that, and then so-and-so found that, and then so-and-so found that. That's a terrible way to do it. Think about doing it sort of thematically. And just one example of doing this, you know, consistent with another empirical study from the region, I found that fishers who used destructive gears were, were poor. You know, that was the only study from that region, so I did it through the one. But, but you know, that's just a way of sort of talking about whether your studies are consistent with or contrasting with, with other studies. So I think that there are several ways to organize the way you discuss your data in the context of other studies, right? And there, there isn't a correct way of doing it, but there's a few. One is to do it by research question, right? So you've got, say, three research questions, and then you sort of talk about your, you discuss how, what your findings are in the context of other studies by research question. You might do it by the key or most interesting result, right? Maybe you've got a bunch of really cool results and you don't, you don't want to discuss all of them. It's too boring. What are the three or four that are really, really interesting that you want to highlight the most? You know, it's actually okay to, to do that. You can actually, you know, in a lot of my studies, there's, you know, whatever, 25 different relationships. I can't talk about each of those. What are the three? 
that I didn't expect to find or that challenge theory in an in a interesting way. Those are the ones and you know, the way that you often do that is putting your sexiest stuff up front. You know, you, so you might do it by, um, by the most interesting results. And start with your most interesting result. Scientists like to sort of build up. That's a terrible way to read, right? That's why journalists never write like that. They never write like scientists because they know how to keep readership, right? Um, you could also do it step by step. And, you know, that sometimes that's the way that you have to do it because whatever the way that the paper works or is structured, sometimes understanding step two is totally contingent on something being really relevant for step one. And it's quite a boring way to do it, but we've had to do that way before uh, in some of the work that I've done. You just, you have to understand why step one was important and what the implications of that were to understand step two. So, you know, you can do it that way. My preference for this, if it all worked out, would be to do number two. You know, I tend to like to just do it by the most interesting stuff, but sometimes it's relevant to do it by research questions, sometimes it's relevant to do it by step. There's no right answer to doing this. There's just, it's just different ways of doing it. Um, the third part of, uh, of my recipe for a discussion is having the critiques, caveats, and future directions in there. And I think this is an absolutely critical part of a paper is sort of every, every study has got limitations. If you're looking at one scale, you're not looking at another scale. You're, there's always trade-offs in what you're doing, right? There's no perfect study out there at all. So what is it about your study that could, could leave room for improvement? Now, um, I say that, and I'll give you an example of one that, that we've done. I also had a student take that a little too far. and just absolutely hammered his own study to the point where you're just like, this is really a crappy study he did, but it wasn't at all. He just took it way too far with that critiques and caveats and was like uber hypercritical about what he was doing. And so, you know, I mean, yes, it's important to be aware of the flaws, but you know, don't go overboard uh, with the critiques and caveats. You're just basically saying, what are some of the issues inherent in doing the way that you did it? and what are the caveats in, in, in interpreting it. Um, so I'll just give an example of one of the ones that uh, we did a few years back. Um, you know, uh, so every study's got limitations. It's okay to discuss them and suggest improvements for future studies. So here we said, you know, our empirical investigation of how natural resource sectors changed along spectra of socioeconomic development and population density was a first step in providing novel insights into observed patterns, strength, right? Um, but had some shortcomings that could potentially be addressed in future studies of livelihood landscapes. First, our, our study only examines a limited number of potential variables to explain the livelihood landscapes. Other alternative models might you know, better explain them using kinship networks, this and that, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, secondly, our paper does not attempt to unravel the complicated social consequences of development and livelihood. Blah, blah. So, you know, basically, I, I don't know if you can tell here, but what I did was take the reviews about everything we'd done wrong, right? This is, this is basically the reviews that we got and put it into a section and say, yeah, you're, you're right, we didn't do that. But rather than be paralyzed by that, we actually just turned that into that section of critiques and caveats there and said, yeah, you know what, you're right. We could have predicted it better with kinship networks, maybe. Somebody else should find out. Go ahead. Yeah. And then <clears throat> the last bit is the sort of, so what? What does it all mean? Right? That's sort of wrapping it up into that, that broader context. Um, and just that the last thing to hammer home again make sure you answer your research questions very clearly. And I brought this up a number of times because as an editor and a frequent reviewer, there's often a really big disconnect between what people say they set out to do and what's done at the end of the day. And I can promise you, one's papers that don't actually address the research question or go way beyond it, uh, they're tend not to do very well in the peer review system. 
right? So you want to have that connection between your research question and what you've done and what it all means there. So just, uh, just sort of a final reminder, reminder to keep that all consistent and to always make sure that, yes, I've answered my research question, even if the answer is unsatisfactory. That's okay. That's a, that's a good answer too, right? Okay, so, you know, some final uh, questions to ask yourself after you've written the, dis the discussion in your whole paper. You know, have I asked a clear research question that's grounded in applied need and or theory? Have I clearly stated how I investigated this question in a way that someone could replicate perfectly? Do my results answer or relate to my research question? Again, you'd be surprised at the number of times when the results have nothing to do with the question that was being asked. Uh, do I have other results that do not answer my research question? And if so, why? You should take them out of this paper. Um, do I bring up results in the discussion, not presented in the results section? Don't do it. Uh, have I used a format that's easy to follow? This is another thing that's actually a, a nice way to think about it. Can you use the same subheadings in the methods and in the results? If you're doing it maybe by research question or uh, by some sort of theme, you know, can you make things as easy to follow as possible? Right? And Again, this gets back to the sort of structure and meta-organization. Think about ways where you can make it as friendly as possible for your reviewer or for your reader.